Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Dynamic 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is Manufacturing Accounting and Dynamic 365 Supply Chain Management. My name is AJ, and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this session through Teams Live Events, and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and or phone number may be viewable by other session participants. By joining, you're agreeing to this experience. The recording will be available on Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for your presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will respond to your questions in the chat during the Q&A segment near the end. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. And presenting for us today from Microsoft, uh, we have two senior fast track solution architects and Krupke and Rachel Profit. Rachel, uh, over to you. Thanks, AJ, and thank you everyone for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be joining from. For those of you who are joining us for the first time in our series, welcome. For those of you who are returning guests, thank you for your commitment to inventory costing, one of our most favorite topics. Let's get started with some quick introductions. I'll let Anne introduce herself. Thanks, Rachel. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Ann Krupke. I am a senior fast track solution architect on the SCM team here at Microsoft. Um, you can see my contact info and my LinkedIn profile here. Feel free to reach out or connect, especially if you want to talk about our mutual love for our favorite thing in the entire world, which is costing or production. Thanks, Ann. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rachel Profit. I am also a senior fast track solution architect. I'm on the Americas team. My contact information is here on the slide. I do invite you to follow me on Twitter. Check out my YouTube channel at Dynamics 365 Unboxed. Connect with me on LinkedIn or follow my blog at Dynamics 365 Lady.com. So this is the fourth Tech Talk in a series of what is now seven, and technically kind of eight, that will dive into the details of inventory costing in Dynamics 365 Supply Chain Management. Yes, that's right. We have officially added a seventh Tech Talk to the series, um, mostly because we couldn't fit everything we wanted to talk about into this Tech Talk. In this Tech Talk, part four, we are going to be focusing um, on uh, all of the aspects of the basic setup, configuration, cost calculations. And in our new seventh session, we are going to then talk about analyzing the production variances. So today is just the basics of production manufacturing and then part seven will now be production variances. Part six will still be focused on the new global inventory accounting add-in and we do hope that you will join us for this additional tech talk. Parts one through three have been recorded and you can find those recordings on the Tech Talk Dynamics community page. We are back as usual with another riddle of the day, but this time it's not an accounting joke. We've really switched it up with a manufacturing joke and we hope you enjoy. Today's question is, what do you call an adequate manufacturing plant? We invite you to put your guesses into the Q&A panel and we will reveal the answer at the end. So let's take a quick look at the agenda and objectives for today's Tech Talk. We'll start with an explanation of production costing and, it, and its importance and basic concepts. We'll then continue to build on these foundations with the components that make up production costing and the parameters that control the behavior. Then we'll switch gears and discuss the pro production process and transactions that affect cost looking at the generated transactions for each type of update that affects costing. Keep in mind, we're only planning to look at production orders, but the same concepts largely apply to batch orders. And remember that we will not be looking at how to analyze variances today. That will be included in our new part seven tech talk. As always, we will wrap up with recommendations and resources. With that, I will hand it over to Anne. Thanks, Rachel. As we dive into today's topic of production costing, let's talk first about some high level concepts. 
No matter what costing methodology you're using, there are several reasons why production costing is important. First is the ability to track variances. When you use standard costing, analyzing variances is even easier because you can track those changes in your general ledger. But with any costing methodology, analyzing variances can help you in your organization spot when there is a problem or a shift in the market or supply chain, for example. Variance can come from equipment that is not operating sufficiently, a change in worker and work behavior, change in purchase costs, and much more. When you can analyze and react to variances, you can work to cut costs and improve margins, which are goals of most organizations at some level. Next is the accuracy of costing. If you're just estimating your cost by guessing which items are picked to an order or summing up labor costs and allocating evenly to all production orders, you have likely no idea what it costs to produce particular items. This can lead to bad decision making on the production floor. When you take steps to build more accurate bombs and routes, you can more accurately define the expected cost for a produced item and then monitor the variances, again giving you the power to potentially reduce costs and increase margins. Lastly is the traceability of costs. While traceability is critical in some industries, like the food industry, for example, being able to trace costs can tell you where the problem is exactly in your production process. It can help you determine if you have supply chain issues, a quality issue, machine issues, or a workforce issue, and you can narrow your analytical efforts in the right place. But keep in mind that with accuracy and traceability comes more detail, and with more detail, you can end up creating overhead in your manufacturing process when you require users to manually log time or materials to the production process. So you'll need to weigh the benefits and cost of effort and consider whether auto automation may be needed. When we analyze how the cost of a production or batch order is determined, there are three main components that make up the cost. First, there are the material costs. These are for the items and subcontracted services that you include in your bombs or formulas. This can represent raw materials or subassemblies that are consumed in order to make our finished product. Material costs are typically recorded based on the quantity of items or services consumed. The next component that contributes to the cost of production is labor costs. Labor costs include shop floor operators, machines used in production, work cells, etc. Labor costs are typically recorded as a function of production time or the quantity produced. The final component that contributes to the cost of production is indirect costs, also known as overheads. These represent costs like rent, utilities, machine depreciation, SG&A expenses, and more. As we mentioned in our previous tech talk, indirect costs are calculated as a function of input material, labor time or costs, or output units. Once you add all these up, they create what we call the cost of conversion, which is the total cost of a manufactured item. We will spend this tech talk covering how we calculate these components and view the total cost of production on a specific production order. Taking these three components of material, labor, and overhead, let's take a quick look at how and where the costs are sourced in the three different manufacturing processes that are supported in Dynamics 365. In our table, we have each of our manufacturing types, discrete, which uses production orders, process manufacturing, which uses batch orders, and lean, which uses Kanbans. For discrete manufacturing, material costs are derived from the bill of materials, labor costs come from routes, and overheads come from the costing sheet. Process manufacturing is very similar, but instead of bills of materials, we use formulas to track our material costs. Lean manufacturing is very different in that it uses production flows to track both material and labor costs of our Kanbans, and it doesn't cost, assign costs to specific Kanbans like we do for production or batch orders. We do still use the costing sheet with lean to calculate overheads. No matter which manufacturing method you use, or even if you use a mixed manufacturing mode, you can further classify your material, labor, and overhead costs by using cost groups, which we covered in our last tech talk and which we will see in action today. For today's conversation, we will be diving into discrete manufacturing scenarios, and we won't be covering batch orders or Kanban specifically. If you're interested in deep dives on either of these topics, please vote on our survey in additional sessions. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Rachel to talk about our cost components in production. Thanks, Anne. 
Now that we have a basic understanding of the components and the importance of production talking, we're going to dive into the details of how the cost is calculated for each of these components. Let's start by reviewing the components and configuration that's used in a bill of materials. A bill of materials is the list of items that we consume in order to create our finished good product. Here you can see a sample bomb for our 12 by 12 velvet pillow with three lines. First, you'll notice the site field is mandatory for a bomb version. You might recall from our last tech talk that standard costs are always set by site, but any bomb calculation is always done by site, no matter what costing methodology you use. So if you manufacture an item in more than one site, you'll need one bomb version per site. On the bottom half of the screen, you'll notice that there are three lines. Each line represents a single item that will be consumed in the bomb. The items must be released products, and many of the default settings that are set on the item come from the release product details page on the engineering fast tab. As you look across the grid, you'll see the quantity and per series fields. This is where you indicate how many of the item are required to make the quantity being produced, which is specified in the from quantity field on the header of the bomb. It's important to ensure that the unit of measure is indicated properly to control the quantity that will be consumed. Next, you'll notice the constant scrap and variable scrap fields at the end of the grid. This page has been personalized to show these fields, which are normally found over on the details. Constant scrap is expressed in the units that are defined on the bomb line. In this example, the fabric has a constant scrap of 0.25 yards. This amount does not change even if more fabric is consumed on a specific production order. Variable scrap is expressed as a percentage of the item um, it is related to. In this example, you can see that 5% of the thread is wasted and consumed as scrap when you produce this pillow. You'll also notice that the polyfilling line on this bomb has no scrap. In the most simple terms, cost categories are used to define the cost of labor. They only apply to manufacturing environments that use routing. You can assign them to resources, resource groups, and route operations in Dynamics 365. Cost categories are known by several other names such as labor, rate codes, or machine rate codes. Although you can't type directly into the cost price field on the cost category, you can use this field to view the current active cost. The costs are added through a costing version and you can access them by clicking price in the cost categories page. You can optionally link a cost category to a specific worker. This allows you to maintain a cost for each worker to get the most accurate costing in the system. If you prefer to use a blended rate, then you'll create a resource or resource group with a cost on the cost category for that blended rate. Each cost category is linked to a cost group. This is used to classify where in the cost rollup or costing sheet the cost should be summarized. For more information about the cost groups, you can refer back to part three in our Tech Talk series. You can assign ledger accounts to each cost group to control where costs are going to be recorded in the general ledger. The accounts are required when you set the production control parameter for ledger posting to the item and category option. If the option for item and category is selected and you leave these accounts blank, an error message will be received when you post a transaction, such as a route card journal, job card journal, report is finished, or when you end a production order. On the right, you can now see a screenshot of a resource. Resources are the people, vendors, machines, tools, and so on that perform or are used in the production process. Each resource or resource group can be set up with a default scrap percentage. This is copied into any route lines that use the resource. Each resource or resource group can also be set up with the default cost categories that are copied into the route lines. You can override these settings on each route. Finally, we have the default times for the resource or resource group. Oftentimes, these are left blank and filled in on each route but that can vary from industry to industry. 
setup, runtime, and process quantity can affect both the cost and the schedule, while the queue time before and the transit times only affect the schedule and not the cost. Keep in mind that the values can be overridden on each route line. So let's take a closer look at some considerations for cost categories. When you are considering how many cost categories to create, there are a number of considerations that you'll want to keep in mind. We have grouped the considerations into three categories. The first being accuracy. It is important to note that each cost category can have one cost defined per site. If you need a different cost for each machine in your production facility, then you'll need one cost category per resource. If you have the same machine in many facilities or multiple of the same machine, and they all have the same cost, you can create one cost category that is linked to a resource group or multiple resources. The same principle applies to people in your operations. If you have created each production floor worker in your warehouse, you can create one cost category for each person that directly correlates to the worker's compensation. This is a very high level of detail and is not common. It's more likely that you'll create one cost category for all human labor with a blended average rate or a handful of cost categories for different types of workers or levels of workers, for example. Remember that if the same resource is used in more than one site, you can specify the cost per site and there's not a need to create one cost category for each site. The next consideration is for the ledger. There are three basic ways to post labor related costs to the ledger. The most detailed way is by using the ledger account specified on the resource, followed next by the resource group. Cost categories, though, are the most common way to specify ledger accounts. So if you need to recognize labor costs in your ledger in three different ledger accounts, you'll need a minimum of three cost categories. You can link multiple cost categories to the same ledger account if needed, but this may make reconciliation more difficult. Lastly, there are some additional detailed settings and considerations you'll want to think about. First, remember that each cost category links to one cost group, while many cost categories can be linked to the same cost group. Your cost categories are likely to be more detailed than your cost groups. You'll have the ability to report on your costs by cost category, so you'll want to think about the reporting requirements from a subledger standpoint. If you need operational reporting at a more detailed level than what is required in the general ledger, you might create more cost categories. Lastly is the maintenance of your cost categories. For example, if you create one cost category for each worker, this could be a lot of maintenance to update and maintain the cost price for each worker anytime the employee's pay changes. You'll want to consider if an integration with other systems will be required to maintain the data. You'll want to set a policy for reviewing and updating your cost category prices to ensure the costs are calculated accurately in your cost rollups or cost calculations. Now, Remember that routes are used to define the labor process for your production orders and define the resources you'll use in your production process for finished goods. Here you can see a sample route for the purple, purple velvet pillows, and you can see we have three operations. But first, let us take notice of the site. Just like bonds require a site, route versions require a site as well, and the costs are always site specific. Moving down to the lines, we have operations. In our example, we have three operations for cutting, sewing, and stuffing. This grid has been personalized again to bring all the critical fields to the grid. The first thing to notice about the lines is the costing resource. The costing resource is critical to select which resource the estimated cost will be calculated from. This is especially important when you have more than one possible resource that can run a specific operation. Next is the runtime and run category. The runtime is expressed in hours to indicate how long the operation takes, and the runtime category is the cost category that's used to define the labor cost for those runtime hours. You can see in our example that cutting takes one hour, sewing takes 0.1 hours, and stuffing takes one hour. 
Next, we have the process quantity and quantity category. The process quantity is the number of the finished good item that will be produced in the time you have specified in your runtime field. And the quantity category indicates which costing category should be used for adding labor based on the quantity you produce. In our example, you can see that the process quantity is for 20, indicating the runtime of one hour is to cut 20 pieces worth of fabric. Sewing is expressed as one for the process quantity and the stuffing is expressed as 10. The next set of fields is the setup time and setup category. Setup time is used to get the machinery or equipment set up to run the operation and is a one-time operation per production order route line. The setup category determines how the labor for the setup will be costed. In our example, you can see that we have the cutting operation has 0.25 hours of setup time. Moving on, we only have one type of scrap for routes and the labor component. It's expressed as a percentage. In this example, no lines have any scrap built into the labor. The last field that we'll take a look at and talk about controls how costing works is the route group. Route groups are critical to determine which part of the operation will have costs calculated. You can see that the first line for cutting in our example has a route group of setup run, which is configured to add costs for both the setup time and the runtime. You'll also notice that this line has a runtime category and a setup category specified to match that requirement. The next line for the sewing only includes a runtime category and the route group is set to run, indicating that only the runtime will be costed. In our example, the last line for stuffing has a runtime specified, but the cost on the labor is calculated only by the process quantity, which in this case has a quantity category and the route group is set to quantity. If you enter times but do not select a route group that calculates those costs, the time will not be calculated into the cost, only the time will be added into the production schedule. Sometimes companies choose not to set up routes for labor costs and instead use a service item on the bomb to allocate labor costs to the production order. This is not a best practice for manufacturing costing as it does not give you the same control over labor cost calculations, actual tracking, variance analysis, or indirect cost calculations. The last component that contributes to the cost of your production or conversion is the indirect costs or overheads. So let's switch over to the system and take a closer look at the setup for indirect costs in the costing sheet. I'm here in the costing sheet in the Purple Pillow Company. Let's look at the setup and configuration for some indirect costs. The first example we will look at is the percent of purchase price for the transportation overhead. You can see this example is set up as a surcharge. When you click on the subtype drop-down box, you'll notice there's only one option for level. This is because purchased items indirect costs are always calculated at the lowest level. If we compare this to a surcharge for cost of conversion using the material overhead as our example, you'll see the node type is surcharge and there are three options for the subtype. You can select level, sublevel, or total. When you're configuring a surcharge, you'll see a fast tab called surcharge. This is where you can configure the percentage rate for the indirect cost. If you select a different indirect cost, such as plant overhead in this example, which is configured as an output unit based overhead, you'll notice that you get a rate tab instead. Likewise, if I select the labor overhead node, which is set as a rate, you'll see that rate is specified as an amount. Now let's talk a little bit about the absorption basis tab. Using the same example for the labor overhead, you can see the absorption basis tab. When you look at the subtype for this example, you can see we have three options for process, setup, and quantity, which relate to the labor times you can add to the route on the production order. You can see in this example, the absorption basis is set to the COC labor node. This refers to the COC labor node in the costing sheet tree, which has five cost groups underneath it for the various types of labor. By selecting process, this indicates that the rate will apply to any process time that is added to the routes where the route line is set to any of these cost groups. 
In this example, you can see on the rate tab that we are charging $2. Now, let's look at the absorption basis for the material overhead. This time, the subtype is set to total, which defaults onto the lines of the absorption basis. Here we have selected the node called COC material, which refers to the entire node for materials under the cost of conversion. The rate that is added in this example is set to on the surcharge tab, and in this example is set to 3%. Now let's look at the plant overhead for machine depreciation. This type of node supports three subtypes for quantity, volume, and weight. You'll notice that this type has no absorption basis. Now let's create a new indirect cost by clicking on the new button. First, we'll need to select the node type. So for this example, let's create an input unit based calculation. You'll want to enter a description and when you're ready, you can click OK. Next, uh, so when you're selecting the subtype for an input unit based overhead, you can choose between weight and volume. And this is referring to the weight or volume of all the items that are being input into the production order or issued or picked, in other words. Next, we need to define the absorption basis or which nodes from the costing sheet this overhead will apply to. For this example, I will select the COC materials node so that the overhead applies to all raw materials that are input into the production order. If you only wanted this rule to apply to packaging, for example, you could instead select COC M4 packaging node. The next thing you need to do is define the rate. You'll need to select the costing version and then enter the site. This is done down on the rate tab. So I'll select the version. In my case, I'm using the current fiscal period. I'll enter the site. For this example, I'll use one. And then in the amount field, I'll enter the amount. For this example, I use 25 cents. The next step in the process is to indicate where the indirect cost should post to in the general ledger. So I'll expand the ledger postings fast tab and enter the main accounts to be used for the posting. For my example, I will use 600522 for the estimated indirect cost absorbed and account 150250 for the estimated indirect cost consumed on my balance sheet. I repeat these two accounts for the financial postings as well. Once you're finished, you'll want to validate the costing sheet to ensure there are no errors. You can see that after I click the validate button, I get a confirmation message that there are no errors. And then I can save my changes. Keep in mind that you'll also want to activate your cost prices in your costing version, which can be done from this screen or directly from the costing version. When we are calculating our costs of produced items, it's also important to choose the correct lot size to calculate the cost. And to understand why, let's take a look at an example. Let's assume in our production process, one of our operations requires setting up the machine to start the job. This setup time is the same no matter how many units we produce. So I set it up in the system as a fixed cost. Now, if I calculate my cost for a lot size of one, the entire setup time fixed cost amount is going to be allocated to the cost of my finished good item. But what if I don't normally produce one item at a time? Maybe I normally do five at a time in this case. If I set my lot size to five units during cost calculation, then the setup time fixed cost amount is split evenly across each unit of inventory that I produce. And so the impact to the unit price is much less than when I set my lot size to one. You can use the default order quantity setup on the item to define the standard lot size that should be used in cost calculations to make sure that you're allocating your fixed costs at a reasonable amount. There are a number of settings that control the behavior of production orders from a costing perspective. So we're gonna switch gears and take a look at some of those. Here we have a screenshot of the production control parameters page. 
The first setting I want to talk about is the ledger posting parameter. This is a critical field that defines how you will configure the ledger postings for your production process. You can choose between item and resource, item and category, or production group. This is important to decide before you start defining your resources, resource groups, cost categories, and production groups. When you select an item and resource or item and category from the dropdown, all material related costs will come from the inventory posting profile page. When you choose item and resource, the labor will come from the resource or resource group. This gives you the most granular control over your production posting. If you select item and category, the labor posting accounts will come from the cost category. Well, if you choose production group, all of the posting for labor, material, and indirect costs will come from the production group page. In the posting section, there are several fields that control how the postings will work with production orders. By selecting the post picking list in Ledger or the report as finished in Ledger, you're indicating that you want to post IIP or inventory in process and WIP or work in process to the Ledger. These are the physical updates of your production order and in most organizations, it is desired to have an accrual of the production process in the general Ledger for financial statements. This is especially true for long running production processes. If you have a very high volume short production time, there may not be as much value to enabling these options. The next setting is called post excluding transaction type. If you enable this option, the transaction type is not included in the posting, which results in a more summarized voucher. Generally, you'll want a more detailed voucher to ease your reconciliation process. So in most cases, you'll not want to enable this option. The final option here is called increasing remaining quantity with error quantity. This indicates if you want to increase the production run when you report an error quantity. The next setting we want to look at is called price calculation. This option is used to indicate that you want the system to perform a price calculation when you estimate the production order. Keep in mind that if you skip this step and go straight to the start process, the system will perform the estimation for you automatically behind the scenes. If you don't select this option, you cannot see the estimated production price in the price details page, which we'll be taking a look at more closely later. We generally recommend that you select this option so that you can easily compare the estimated cost to the actual costs. The last study we want to talk about is the effect that affects costing is the use estimated cost price option under the report is finished area. This option is used uh, uses the estimated cost from the beginning of the production order as the physical cost when your report is finished the production order. You'll want to carefully consider this option for your business, especially when there's a long de delay between the report is finished and the ending of a production order. Keep in mind that no matter what costing methodology you use, the same general rules will apply to costing. So if you're using standard or moving average, for example, the system will always use the standard or moving average. But when actuals or average costing is used, this may have a bigger impact. It's also worth noting that even when you select this option, the final costs will still follow the same rules of your costing methodology when you end the production order and run the inventory close process. Now I'm going to hand it back over to Anne. Thanks, Rachel. Now that we've looked at the configurations of cost on production orders, let's look at how we track those costs in the production order lifecycle. First, let's review the production order lifecycle steps as they relate to production costing. There are some additional steps that don't necessarily impact costing that we're not going to talk about in detail, um, but they exist. The first step is to create the production order. As part of the production order creation process, the system takes a copy of the assigned BOM and route and adds them to the production order. These are called the production bomb and the production route and can be reflect, edited to reflect the changes to the specific order without updating the master bomb and route records on the item. Next, we estimate the production order. This runs a bomb calculation for the finished good item using the production bomb and route as the cost components and the production quantity as the lot size. 
This establishes the expected cost of our particular production order. If we change the production bomber route, then we need to re-estimate our production order. Once the production order is in process, we will post our materials and resource consumption against the order. For materials, this is done using a pick list journal, and for resources, this is done via a route or job cart journal. We can have multiple journals of each type posted against the same production order, and often we see these postings, postings triggered by the production start step or the production report is finished step. Speaking of which, the report is finished step happens once we've completed our finished good item and we want to record it into inventory. Some companies post multiple report is finished updates throughout the order process, and others post a single report is finished journal at the end of the production run. Finally, we end financially end the production order. This is the equivalent of invoicing a sales or purchase order, and once it has been done, it cannot be reversed. Now let's revisit our core costing concepts as they apply to the production process. All the updates post against source transactions related to our specific production order. Posting our pick list will create a physical issue update for each of these lines on the pick list. This decreases the on-hand inventory of our raw materials and allocates them to a, the cost to a WIP materials account. The next inventory update is that report is finished. This is a physical receipt update on the production order, which adds our finished good item into inventory. The production order ending step is used to financially update both of our earlier inventory transactions, the material consumption and the report is finished. At this point, the final cost of the finished product will be updated now that all of our cost components have been recorded. Picklists can be post posted a few different ways. Manually, automatically based on material flushing principle, via the production floor execution interface, and from the warehouse management mobile app. Each of these methods results in a picklist journal being created and posted in the system. We have one line on the picklist for each item that we are consuming on the order. Let's take a look at some of the key pieces of information recorded in the picklist journal. First, we notice that we capture a date for each of the picklist lines. This corresponds to the physical date on the source transaction record. Next, we see our proposal and consumption fields. The proposal field indicates the quantity of the material specified by the bomb that was expected to be used. The consumption field is where we record the actual amount of materials which we used. We can also report specific consumption for material scrap, which is recorded in the scrap field. As we've mentioned previously, we can choose whether to allocate this cost to a separate scrap account or to the overall production order. Similar to pick lists, we have multiple options for how we post our report is finished or RAF journals. Manually via the D365 user interface, via the production floor execution interface, and from the warehouse management mobile app. Our RAF journal in discrete manufacturing has a single line for the finished good item we are producing. In process manufacturing, we have the ability to report multiple outputs as finished, but we won't dive into that scenario in this tech talk. Just like with pick lists, we have a date for the report as finished, which will populate the physical date on the source transaction for the finished good. When we report as finished, we record the good quantity which we produced, and we also have the option to report an error quantity and an error cause as well, which lets us record scrap on a finished good level without putting defective products into inventory. This screenshot shows the view of the various inventory postings that occurred on our production order. We have five issue transactions for the material issued to the order and a single receipt transaction for the finished good that was produced. The physical cost of the receipt is posted at the standard cost of the item, since that's the cost model it is assigned, and the financial cost is the total actual cost of the production order. The adjustment of $25.24 is the total of the variance on the production order. We will review production variance in more detail in part seven of the series. While our previous tech talks have focused heavily on inventory transactions, in the production order lifecycle, we have another type of transaction that occurs, which is called a route transaction. 
It's the same concept of physical and financial updates as inventory transactions, but route transactions do not impact inventory and therefore we don't assign them an issue or a receipt classification. Our physical route transaction occurs when we post our route or job card journal. The financial update occurs when we end the production order. Route transactions are created by posting either a route card journal or a job card journal. The main difference between these two types of journals is that job cards are more granular and use start and stop times to calculate the amount of hours that it actually took to produce the item. Route card journals are either posted manually in the user interface or automatically at production start or finish. Job card journals are typically posted based on user interactions with the production floor execution interface or the job card terminal. In this case, we have used a route card journal to record the consumption of labor on the production order. Again, we have a date on each line, which will become the physical date used on the route transaction. Then we have the specific resource or resource group that was used to execute the operation. Each line in our journal corresponds to one task of the operation on the route. As we can see, the system has split the setup and process time of the cutting operation into two different lines. On route and job card journals, we record the number of hours used and how many units were produced for that amount of time. We again have the option to specify a good quantity and an error quantity for each of these steps. Lastly, we can see the cost categories that will be used for the cost of each of these activities. Since setup time and process time are split into separate tasks, we have only one category on the journal line for hours and another one for quantity. Here we can, on the next slide, we can see the transaction view of the various route transactions posted on our production order. We see the physical and financial dates from the route card and ending were posted, respectively, and the costs that were posted to the production order in the amount field. Just like route transactions, we also have indirect cost transactions that are created on the production order to record the cost of the overhead we've calculated. Based on the method we use to calculate indirect cost, we can have the physical transaction update occur when we post the pick list, route or job card, and when we report is finished. The pick list is going to be based on cost of conversion materials, the route being the cost of labor conversion, and report is finished being on the cost of conversion for output units. As with all other production transactions, we financially update the transaction on production order ending. There's no way to post a manual value for an indirect cost on a production order since they're all automatically posted based on our calculation criteria set up in the costing sheet. We can, however, view the posted indirect cost transactions as pictured here on a specific production order, see the physical and financial dates, the transaction cost, and the details of what the indirect costs were. Now that we've covered the different types of cost postings during production, let's go into the system and see how we can report on different costs against what was estimated. To view our variation details, we want to go to the production control module and view all production orders. We'll select the specific production order we want to view. And then at the top on the manage cost tab, we will click view calculation details. Our first view gives us the estimated unit price for each item we're producing, which was done in the estimation step. We can see we ended up with a unit price of $23.65 estimated. If we want to see the actuals, we can go to the overview costing tab, which will show us for the entire order what our estimated consumption and cost were and our realized consumption and cost. At the top level, which is zero, that is the full cost, and all of the components are on these level one lines underneath. We've got three lines for item, which is our material cost. The setup processing quantity are our labor costs, output unit, surcharge, and rate are our overheads for this order. We have an additional material and labor cost at the bottom that we added in throughout the order. So here again, we can see what our estimated consumption and realized consumption were, the estimated cost and realized cost to understand some of where our costs may differ from estimated to actual. 
If we want to see this information on a more summarized view, we have the ability to view it in our costing sheet format. So here we see all of our cost groups and our costs per cost group. We can view on a single total or multi multi level. Total shows us that level zero, which isn't a lot of information, right? It's just the top level. Single goes one level down and shows us each of those cost groups and their costs and multi would go multiple levels if we had them in a, in a nested production order. We can also view per unit, per lot size and per quantity what the cost was. Quantity lets you define now in that quantity field what value you want and lot size pulls from the production order quantity. So this is our total cost for the entire production order quantity. We can also switch this view between the estimated cost and the actual cost. So we can see the cost breakdown as it was estimated and the actual cost breakdown in our costing sheet format. So that was a view of some of the ways we can see what costs were estimated and what our actual costs were on a particular production order. Now I'm going to hand it back to Rachel to wrap us up. Thanks, Anne. Let's go ahead and take a look at resources and recommendations. We wanted to start today with a list of uh, options and settings that you can and cannot change. So we've pulled together a list um, and it's important to remember that these configurations have impact on your costing in the system and you'll want to define good data management policies and security around these configurations. First is the list of things that you can change at any time to control your cost and cost calculations. You can change bombs and formulas directly, but you may want to consider using versions to track the changes and for more advanced control, you can consider engineering change management. This is also true of your routes. Resources and resource groups can be added or changed at any time, but remember that changes you make to the defaults are for new routes. You may need to do mass updates to many routes when a change is needed. You can also add or change cost groups at any time, but you must update and add your new cost groups to the costing sheet for the analysis and breakdowns to pull through the entire system. You can also create and update your cost categories at any time. Keep in mind that costs are date effective with a from date, so you cannot backdate a cost on a costing version. And remember that if you change the cost, you'll likely need to run new cost calculations to make that cost flow through all of the bombs and routes that use those cost categories. You can also create and update calculation groups at any time, but these settings will only apply when you run the next cost calculation. Now, let's look at a list of the things that you cannot or should not change once transactions exist. First are the item model groups. While there are some settings that can be modified on the item model group, you'll want to test carefully with any change. To change the item model group completely on an item, you'll need to follow the process we outlined in part two of our series. The same is generally true for item groups, the system will allow you to change the main accounts directly on the item group at any time, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. We do recommend tight control and auditing of these changes to ensure you can reconcile and through testing of any required changes. If you attempt to change the item group directly on the release product, you'll receive a warning and the system will allow you to proceed, but it warns you that you may not be able to reconcile. You also cannot make changes to your dimension groups after transactions exist. Although it does not affect costing, we do strongly recommend to consider if you want to enable warehouse management on your storage dimensions up front. You cannot change this setting later to be on if you start with it off. Although this does not affect costing, we commonly hear that people want to change this setting later on, so the best thing to do is to enable it up front and do the minimal configuration that is required. Now for our do's and don'ts. The first thing that we've put on our do's list is to make sure you end your production orders to establish a final cost. If you don't end your production orders, your costs may be sitting in WIP and may never make it to their final inventory account. 
You'll also want to make sure that you think about the flexibility and maintainability of your costing sheet. Figuring out the right number of costing groups and cost categories to meet your ledger requirements and your operational reporting is key. Another do on our list is to make sure that you are setting your default order quantities appropriately, especially if you have fixed cost. Like the example we took a look at earlier, having an incorrect default order quantity can ca cause your costs to look very expanded. And as we'll explore in our new part seven, you'll see how it can make your variances very large as well if it's not set correctly. We also recommend that you review your bomb and route data periodically to annual analyze the accuracy. This is typically the job of the cost accountant. And just like you want to maintain your standard costs, you'll want to make sure that you're maintaining the actual bomb and route lines to make sure that they align correctly with what your actual production process looks like. We also recommend that you post picking list and report is finished to the ledger. These are some parameters that we talked about um, in the first section um, earlier, and we, we generally recommend that you turn those on. And our last do is we always recommend that you run the inventory close once per period, no matter what costing methodology you're using. It does uh, close out that inventory and prevent any backdating of transactions. And depending on your costing methodology, that's the process that adjusts your inventory to its true value based on the method you've selected. Some don'ts to consider. The first one is don't double count your costs, especially when you're thinking about labor as an example. Make sure that you create a list and outline where all of the costs are being contributed to in your routes and overheads. For example, you don't want to include the employee benefits in both the uh, blended rate that you put on a cost category and include it in an overhead. Don't, uh, the next don't that we have is don't end your production orders until you finalize postings and corrections. We recommend that you have a process in place to review those costs, make any adjustments that are necessary, and then you can end it. Once you've ended a production order, it cannot be undone. We also don't recommend that you use service items on the bomb or formula to replace labor and overhead cost configurations. Like we talked about earlier, um, you know, putting it into a bomb while it can increase your cost, it doesn't give you the flexibility that you need uh, or may need further on down the road to calculate indirect costs and reconcile and get things posted into the general ledger in the most uh, appropriate way. And for that reason, we recommend that you generally, even if you uh, just start with a simple route with one line and one generic resource, that would be the preferred method to go about this. And then the last don't that we have is we don't recommend that you enable post excluding transaction type if you need a detailed voucher for reconciliation. So that was another one of those parameters. Um, in most cases, you're going to want that detailed voucher. If you're in a really high volume environment, you might want to summarize your vouchers um, to you know, reduce some of that noise in the general ledger, but consider it carefully, especially from a reporting um, standpoint uh, and what your needs are. As usual, we have pulled together some resources for you. We have created an AKA link to access the recordings. You can find that at aka.ns or slash costing tech talks. We also encourage you to visit the doc site, um, take a look at the new and updated content that we've been creating throughout this series. Uh, we've also got some specific links uh, for the learn content related to the costing sheet, as well as how to configure activity based subcontracting and production flow costing. We invite you to uh, connect with the product team on the Yammer site and submit your ideas out to the ideas site. If you have not already taken the time to complete our survey about additional costing topics, we do invite you to do so. We have added some more if you, if you already voted and you want to vote for some of the additional ones that we've put out there since the first Tech Talk, we do encourage you to go out there and uh, update your votes. Uh, the link to go take that survey is aka.ms forward slash D365 Costing Tech Talks. And that brings us back to our riddle of the day. 
what do you call an adequate manufacturing plant? I know we had quite a few people submit answers, so thank you for that. And do you know what the answer is? I don't know, Rachel. What do you call an adequate manufacturing plant? It's a satisfactory. <laughs> a lot of people got this one right, so I'm, I'm very yeah. proud of our audience today. Yes, I, I appreciate that you're all paying attention and uh, hopefully you enjoy our terrible jokes. Uh, and that brings us to our Q&A portion for today. All right. Let's start with, um, here's a good question. Under what circumstances would the physical and financial accounts be different on the ledger postings? So when we uh, set it's up- a great Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to say it's a great question. Um, you know, obviously we haven't gone to a lot of detail about posting profiles and we are planning another series to dive into that with uh, myself and another colleague. Um, in most cases, they are the same. Um, a lot of it comes down to like your uh, financial statements, how you might want to report them differently. Um, you might... Um, in, in certain countries or regions, there might be specific GL requirements that for regulatory reasons, you need to separate them. And that's really the most common scenario I've seen, but in most cases, they generally are the same. And that's generally what we recommend uh, for easiest reconciliation. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Uh, another good question was I, I think this get, gives us an opportunity to clarify can you give us more details on why we shouldn't use service items in the bomb and I'll, I'll take this one so it is perfectly okay to use service items in your bomb it's very common when you have um, subcontracting for example and you want to track the cost of the subcontracting operation in the cost of your production what what our recommendation is that you don't use service items as a substitute for routes with labor um, resources assigned. So, so what we've seen in the past is sometimes companies may calculate a you know a total labor cost and put it as a service item on the bomb instead of creating a route with the times and the cost categories and the resource assignments. Um, so that is the specific scenario we don't recommend, but it is acceptable to use service items on your bomb if you need to. Anything you want to add, Rachel? Nope, I think that's a great explanation. Okay. Um, we, we did have a question, can we capture resource details under the bomb? Uh, this was something that we did discuss. It's not something that we recommend using like a dummy item to, to you know, capture labor or, um, you know, route uh, resource details in, uh, in the bomb. We do recommend that you use the route and the resources feature. There is a capability to link a resource, uh, like an operation, I should say, a route line to a specific item. So uh, for you know front or back flushing, uh, that feature can be useful, but we don't generally recommend that you put them at your labor components um, or indirect costs as dummy items into the bomb lines that you use the appropriate features. Anything you want to add there, Anne? No, but we did just get another related question, which I can take, which is, is the subcontracting service item on the bomb a stocked or a non-stocked item? Which is a really good question. We do talk about stock versus non-stocked more in our, um, I think it was our first tech talk that we did in this series. But when you're, when you're putting service items on bombs, they should always be stocked items so that we can add the cost. So even though it's technically a product of type service, the item model group still needs to say that this is a stocked item so that we can do what's called a pro forma inventory transaction, which allows us to then take the cost of that service and roll it up into the total cost of our production order. Great. We did have a couple questions about inventory close and recalculation as well. I'll quickly address those. Um, I did include that in my recommendation. We do recommend that you run your inventory close once per period. So if your fiscal periods are a month, yes, that would be monthly. If you're doing 445, it would be every four weeks, four weeks, and then five weeks. 
And from a recalculation standpoint, um, it, it really kind of depends. Um, it's not uncommon for organizations to run inventory recalculations daily. We are going to dive into the close and recalculation process in much more detail in the next part of our series. So we do encourage you to come back to that tech talk and hopefully we'll get all of your close and adjustment questions answered. All right, we're at the top of the hour. We do have a couple extra questions, but again, we're planning on doing a fireside chat coming up, so we will make sure we get back around to the questions we weren't able to answer. Um, thank you for asking so many that we don't have time because I'm glad to see where we have an engaged audience. So thank you very much for the questions. All right, we'll hand it back over to AJ to wrap us up today. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I have posted a short link in the survey. <laughs> I've posted a short link in the Q&A panel that is a survey, and we'd like to hear uh, your feedback on today's session and I just wanted to know what you'd like to see in future events. Any participation is appreciated. As a reminder, the recording of, of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and thank you to the audience for joining us today. This concludes today's event.